Jason again. Hi. Arriving, but uh, it's time to begin. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Greg Beal, or G.K. Beal. And uh, I, I, it's getting to the point where I think this is Greg's third time in recent history to speak, and so it's getting redundant, I guess. But uh, Greg is a graduate of SMU. He went to Dallas Theological Seminary. We entered school there at the same time, so we spent four years together at Dallas, and then Greg attended Believer's Chapel during that time, and this is where he met his wife, Dorinda Garrett. Um, from Dallas Seminary, Greg went to Cambridge University where he got his PhD, and then from there he returned to teach at Grove City College and then Gordon Conwell Seminary. He taught at Wheaton College and then for the last 10 years at uh, at uh, Westminster Theological Seminary, where he occupied the J. Gresham Machen Chair of New Testament Exegesis and Theology. I don't know the full title, but uh, it's a prestigious position. Greg is now here in Dallas teaching at Reformed Theological Seminary, and we're privileged to have him with us. Uh, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. If I've forgotten any accolades, you can correct me. Add. I think we can stop with that. Well, it's good to be here again um, at, at the church I considered home for many years. And uh, so, in fact, I'll even uh, make an allusion to S. Lewis Johnson today at the end of the sermon. Um, if you would open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 18 in verses 1 through 5. Revelation 18, 1 through 5. That'll be our main text, but I hope you have your English Bibles because we're going to be looking at some different texts in the Old Testament. We're going to look at the Old Testament background of this passage, especially verse, um, verse 4. And so uh, let's read and then ask God's blessing on His Word, beginning at Revelation 18. In verse 1, <clears throat> after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory, and he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. <clears throat> She's become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, <clears throat> and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality or her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. <clears throat> well, let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, we do ask that you would help us to understand your word, that your spirit would guide us, and we do pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand, and that uh, as a result of your word this morning, uh, you would cause us to be increasingly conformed to your image, thinking your thoughts after you, saying those, those things pleasing to you, and doing those things honoring to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I'm a little hoarse. Uh, I've, been, I've been lecturing for a number of weeks uh, overseas, and uh, so I came back hoarse. I've asked them to turn the uh, volume up, and that's why we're in this smaller room. So hopefully everybody will be able <clears throat> to hear. I better get my water, though. <clears throat> So I know of a father who uh, is a pastor, and when he, his oldest daughter was seven, he spent an afternoon at the city dump. And he recalled that afternoon the following way. <clears throat> his purpose for this excursion was not to dump garbage, uh, but to observe it. And he backed his Oldsmobile up uh, against the mounds of refuse and 
placed his daughter on the roof with pencil and paper in her hand. He asked her to list every item that she saw. There was, you know, a toy stove, a toy telephone, an old barbecue, uh, a bicycle, play refrigerators, and so on. Everything a little girl uh, would want. And as they drove back into the city talking about this, uh, there drove up by them a, a, a big, huge trailer that had flattened cars on it. And he said, well, that's the ultimate destiny of this really nice car we have now. So it was a, a day, he said, he and his daughter would never forget. An interesting project. Uh, it was a powerful reminder that someday everything we have is going to be junk. In some city dump, the things that have captivated our attention and dominated our lives will smolder beneath a simmering flame, stinking uh, with mounds of rotting garbage. The picture portrays not only the end of the things that we value, but ultimately uh, it's an illustration of the collapse of human culture. Uh, history's not destined to grind on forever, as some people think. <clears throat> it awaits the awesome and terrible judgment of God. A few chapters in the Bible describe this frightful end more pointedly than Revelation 18. And uh, we in the West and in America need to hear it. Now, many believe that the world will never end, <clears throat> but that's not what John says. He says that there will be a final judgment. Notice what he says in verse 20. Rejoice over her who is Babylon, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Now, our focus passage this morning is Revelation 18.4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, that you may not receive <clears throat> of her plagues. This phrase, come out, rings throughout Scripture. Uh, it's not the first time we have this. In fact, we're going to look in the Old Testament. We're going to see that again and again and again, God's people have been told to come out. Revelation actually alludes first, at least echoes, Genesis chapter 12 where in uh, verse 1, <clears throat> Abraham is commanded in this way. Now the Lord said to Abraham, come out from your country, and from your relatives, from your father's house to the land which I will show you. <clears throat> and we need to back up a few verses to see what was he to come out of? Well, verse 31, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, his daughter, his, Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went together from Ur, which is ancient Babylonia, from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. <clears throat> and they went as far as Haran and settled there. And so they stopped. They should have kept going, but they stopped. We're going to see they stopped because they were more comfortable. That was still part of their homeland. They just couldn't come out of it. So we get the command then in verse 1 of chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, come out from your country. Now, Acts chapter 7 and verse 2 reviews uh, this event. And in Acts chapter 7, uh, in verse 2, we have Stephen <clears throat> reviewing this event. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 2, Stephen says this, <clears throat> Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, depart from your country. That is, come out, you and your relatives, come into the land that I will show you. So this says that there was a command before the one in chapter 12 and verse 1. Before they came to Haran, there was a command. And so as we come, let's look back at chapter uh, 11 of uh, Genesis chapter 11, read it again. And Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarah his daughter-in-law's son, Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. Now it's at that point that Acts says they were co commanded to come out from Ur. So they came out 
Then it says, the end of verse 31, they came to Haran and settled there. They didn't go further. So now we're given a second command in chapter 12 and verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, come out. So we got come out, come out. And I think the reason is, is that uh, Abraham was comfortable in the country he was living in. He didn't want to leave the security of his unbelieving homeland and give up everything and trust in only God's guidance for him. Now this double command occurs again, not too much later in the book of Genesis, chapter uh, 19, in describing Sodom and Gomorrah. So if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 19. We're going to be looking at a, a few verses when we're looking really at a biblical theology of come out. That's what we're looking at. A biblical theology. How is come out used throughout the scripture? And how is that a background for our passage? In chapter 19, beginning at verse 12, we're going to read through verse 17. Genesis 19, 12. Then the men said to Lot, whom else have you here? These are the angels who had come to Sodom and into Lot's house. And Lot said, well, a son-in-law and um, <clears throat> your sons and your daughters, whomever you have in the city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out <clears throat> and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters. And he said, up, come out. That's uh, the actual wording in the Hebrew and the Greek. Up, come out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But Lot appeared to be uh, jesting to his sons-in-law. <clears throat> so they, they didn't listen. When morning dawned, the angels then urged Lot with the same command. Up! Apparently Lot wasn't taking his own uh, uh, command to his sons at heart. Up! Take your wife, your daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. <clears throat> and the Greek Old Testament tags on to the end of this verse, come out, just as he had said to his sons-in-laws, come out. But notice verse 16, but he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city came about when they brought them outside that one said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, lest you be swept away. <clears throat> so it's the, he, he's not even able to uh, obey this command. The angels have to drag him out by his hands. And in fact, <clears throat> uh, the same was true with Abraham because the Acts 7 narrative about Abraham that we just read concludes with God removed Abraham into this country. So it's only by God's sovereign grace. You know, Augustine said, Lord, command what you will, but give what you command. There's no way we can obey the commands of God unless it's God's sovereign grace. And that was true. Abraham could not have obeyed that command. God removed him. Lot couldn't do it. The angels dragged him by his hands. So <clears throat> to leave the security of Sodom seemed ridiculous. You might remember that when Lot went to Sodom, that it, it says in chapter 13 and verse 10 of Genesis, it looked like the Garden of Eden. And uh, Abraham said, you know, you choose. So, so Lot chooses what looks to be most beautiful. And <clears throat> it was a beautiful place. Um, in fact, Ezekiel uh, says later, in uh, chapter 16 and verse 49, it says that Sodom and Gomorrah had a lot of arrogance. They were very arrogant. They had a lot of food and lived in ease and did not help the poor and the needy. So it was a place where people lived in ease. They had everything. Lot did not want to leave. He was uh, very secure there. So the angels have to drag him out. And, uh, and he gets the command twice. The command comes to the family. Come out, once to the sons, another to Lot. Just as with Abraham, you get a double command, why? Come out, come out, because they're secure where they are. They're believers, but 
they become obviously conformed to the world. It's hard for them to leave. In fact, Lot's wife couldn't leave, could she? Remember, she looks back. And what happens when you get too attracted to something ungodly? You become like it. What you revere, you resemble, either for ruin or restoration. What she revered, she resembled for her ruin. She became salt. In fact, it says in Deuteronomy 29, 23, in Zephaniah 2, 9, that Sodom and Gomorrah was salt after the judgment. She had become just what she was committed to. May God give us grace to revere the Lord in his image for our restoration increasingly. So Lot's wife and the whole family were commanded, don't look back. She disobeyed. If they had not come out, they would have been destroyed. She was. Now the command comes again, one more time, at the great event of the Exodus. In Exodus chapter 6, we're going to read beginning at verses 6 through 13. <clears throat> The command is not given explicitly, but we're going to see conceptually it is clearly given. In Exodus chapter 6, in verse 6, remember what we're doing. We're, we're looking at what's behind this phrase, come out of her, my people, in Revelation 18.4. <clears throat> in chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, therefore, God says to Moses, say, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I'll bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. <clears throat> I will take you for my people. I'll be your God. You'll know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So God was going to bring them out. They couldn't bring themselves out. And I'll bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and crucial bondage. In other words, Moses was saying, let's go out, come out. They didn't listen because of their despondency, it says. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying again in verse 11, we're still in chapter 6 of Exodus, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me from unskilled in speech? Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And we'll see repeatedly, Moses goes before Pharaoh and says, Let my people go, let my people go. But notice that verse 13 says, that Moses was to give a charge to the sons of Israel. What was that charge? Well, every time he tells Pharaoh, let my people go, it's to Israel, come out, come out. And so we get, we get definitely a repeated uh, conceptual command that's implied every time that uh, Moses goes before Pharaoh. And then once again, we get the double command in Jeremiah, Israel's in Babylon, they're comfortable again. And by the way, Israel didn't want to come out of Egypt. Uh, even though they were slaves, once they get in the wilderness, do you remember? They want to come back because there's more food in Egypt than there was in the, in the wilderness. So in Jeremiah, in chapter 51, we find again this double command. Look at it in verse 45 of chapter 51. Come out, same phrase, come out from her midst, my people. And that is the most direct allusion in our passage in Revelation uh, chapter 18, 4, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and so that you will not receive of her judgment. But the command has already come earlier in chapter 50. Well, chapter 51, actually, in verse uh, 6, flee. It's a different verb, but same idea. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. Israel had lived in Babylon for 70 years. They had become comfortable. They had built homes. They had jobs. They did not want to come out. So you get these repeated commands. Flee. Come out. And uh, notice 
what this judgment will be in 51 of Jeremiah and verse 7. Babylon's been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine. The nations are growing mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen, been broken, wail over her. Bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. And some of the Israelites may be saying, it's not too bad. Maybe, maybe Babylon can be healed. We applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her. Let us each go to his own country, for her judgment has reached to heaven, towers up to the skies. So Israel had grown accustomed. They need the multiple command. Come out, come out. It occurs again in Isaiah 52. Again, same situation. Israel's in Babylon. Chapter 52 of Isaiah and verse 11. Come out from there. Touch nothing unclean. Come out of her. Purify yourselves. Israel is to come out of Babylon. They, they're given this double command. You get the multiple commands. Come out, come out. Because the people of God were accustomed to living in ease. And it's hard for them to come out. Our main uh, illusion here in our passage is from Jeremiah 51 and verse 45, come out from her midst, my people. And so as we look at our passage in chapter 18 and verse 4 again, <clears throat> notice what it says. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, that you may not receive of her plagues. All of these multiple commands to come out, come out, come out, were pointing toward the final end time people of God who are now commanded to come out. And this time, is Babylon just a little local place? Well, we're going to see it's not. So the idea in our passage, in the light of everything we've looked at in the Old Testament, is God's people are to separate from the world's sin lest we become judged like the world. So people are confessing to be God's people, but if they're not coming out, they'll be judged. We're to separate from the world's sin lest we become judged like the world. But <clears throat> who is it exactly that we're to come out of? Well, it's very clear that the her here, come out of her, is Babylon. Notice in verse 2, he cried out with mighty voice saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And uh, so who is Babylon the great? Uh, indeed, the Old Testament promised that when Babylon was judged in the Old Testament, Babylon would never rise again. Now, there are some uh, commentators who believe that Babylon will rise again as a nation and that that's what Revelation here is talking about. But that would really be against what the Old Testament says. Because the Old Testament says when Babylon was to be destroyed, she would never rise again. Uh, listen to the chapter we've just been reading in Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 62. <clears throat> Jeremiah 51, 62. I told you we'd be looking at a lot of verses today. The Bible's a unity, and that's what we're looking at today. Jeremiah 51, 62 Say, thou, O Lord, you promised concerning this place, Babylon, to cut it off, so there'll be nothing dwelling in it, whether man or beast. It will be a perpetual desolation. It'll come about as you finish reading the scroll, you'll tie a stone to it, throw it into the middle of the Euphrates, and say, just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise again because of the calamity that I'm going to bring upon her. And likewise, um, <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 50 and verses 39 to 40. Same thing. Verse 39. Therefore the desert creatures will live there in Babylon along with the jackals, the ostriches will also live in it. Now listen. And it will never again be inhabited or dwelt in from generation to generation as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors. Isaiah Chapter 13 and verse 19 says the same thing. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, 
will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. It'll be like Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be a geopolitical country again. The idea that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy that there'll be a Babylon in the Middle East goes against Scripture. And uh, when Babylon was destroyed in 593 B.C., would never rise again. This is not about a fulfillment of prophecy, about a revival of a literal Babylon as a geopolitical nation. Well, who is Babylon then? It's not certainly talking about local Babylon, as we've seen. Remember that Babylon was a place for God's people of three things. A place of exile, persecution, and temptations to compromise. And now what John is saying is, the whole world has become Babylon the Great. It symbolizes the world which trusts in itself, its own security, whether it be economic, social, religious security, whatever it may be. <clears throat> Remember that in Revelation, the predominant way that Revelation communicates uh, is, is not literally. Some say, you know, unless Revelation, uh, uh, un unless you're forced to interpret figuratively, <clears throat> Uh, you should interpret literally. But actually, Revelation 1.1 says this. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God showed to him uh, about what must come to place quickly, and he signified it to his angel, by his angel, to his servant John. He signified it. If your King James will have signified. Some translations just have communicated, but it's actually signified, communicated by symbols. So the approach to the book of Revelation really is, unless you're forced to take it literally, take it figuratively. That's the programmatic approach. So um, <clears throat> Babylon is a symbol, and that Babylon is a symbol is very clear. Look at chapter 17 with me and verse 1. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So are we speaking literally here of a prostitute who's speaking on a giant inner tube uh, uh, on, you know, on, on the waters? Um, what's very clear, John himself interprets this symbol. Notice verse 15 of chapter 17 he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. It's not literal waters. In verse 18, the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So Babylon has become the world now. Babylon is the place. The whole world is the place of our exile. It is the place where we're persecuted. It is the place where we're tempted. It is the place we're passing through as Christians. I have to often catch myself <clears throat> when I get too depressed about politics and economics, uh, not get too caught up in my own particular views. Sometimes I find myself doing that, and I have to step back and say, oh, let me jolt myself. I'm a pilgrim. I shouldn't hold too tightly to anything, including political ideologies and economic theories as much as I may be committed to them on this earth. I shouldn't be ultimately committed to those instead of to my identification as the Lord and as one who is moving through this world. I'm in exile. What should I expect? Revelation 18.4 says, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins and that you may not receive of her plagues. What are the sins we should separate from? that we should come out from? Should we separate spiritually and physically the way Abraham, Lot, and Israel did? Well, it's difficult to separate physically now since the whole world is Babylon. It's permeated by ungodliness. There's no nation or land we can flee to, which appeared to be the case with uh, Israel and Egypt and uh, Lot and Abraham and Israel coming out of Babylon. Um, <clears throat> I remember there was a news item many years ago, um, right after the Falklands um, battle that England had with Argentina. It was about a family who moved from a city in England 
you know, they were tired of, uh, you know, the uh, very hurried rate of living in a city, the crime, so forth and so on. They said, we're going to move somewhere where it's going to really be uh, calm and peaceful. So they moved to the Falklands and bought, you know, some grassy lands for their sheep and everything was fine and all of a sudden their pasture lands became battlefield. You can't, you can't geographically uh, find peace most of the time. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean with the moral people of this world or with the covetous swindlers or with idolaters for then you would have to come out of the world. He uses the same word there for come out. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, <clears throat> quoting from Isaiah that we looked at earlier, notice what he says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, or listen to it. <clears throat> we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'll be their God, they'll be my people. Now listen, here he's quoting Isaiah. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. It's where we found the double come outs. But Paul, that, that was referring to Israel coming out of Babylon. That's a quotation from Isaiah. Now it's applied to people in Corinth. So Corinth is part of Babylon the Great. They, they can't leave the location of Corinth and be godly. They have to leave the ungodliness of the Corinthian culture while still living in it to come out. So we should not primarily separate physically from the world, but spiritually. Of course, we know uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says that uh, bad company corrupts good morals. And we, we know that, you know, if you're living too much with the ungodly and they become uh, the main people you want to identify with, well, you need to come out of that. So... How are we to separate spiritually? What sins is Revelation 18.4 referring to that we should come out of? Well, what have we learned from Abraham, Lot, and Israel? <clears throat> I think the idea is we should separate from trusting in the world's security in the same way that unbelievers do. And we as believers can become like unbelievers. Again, Revelation 18.3 says this <clears throat> about Babylon. And, and th this will help us get an idea of how easily it is to become conformed to the world, to be at ease as the Sodomites and the Gomorrites were. Chapter 18 and verse 3, all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. So they drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Chapter 17, likewise, verse 2 says, that with Babylon the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So uh, they're, they're going along with Babylon because they're intoxicated. They're giving in to her temptations. And think about the effects of intoxication. <clears throat> Number one, it removes a desire to resist temptation. When people drink too much, they they become open to sexual temptation, maybe temptation to gamble and lose their money, other kinds of temptations. Secondly, wine and uh, intoxication, uh, drunkenness, numbs you to uh, your own uh, lack of security. Uh, it blinds you to your own uh, insecurity. You've maybe seen the commercial where someone's drunk and to show off they're walking on a building. And then they walk off the building and fall to their death. And intoxication not only removes the desire to resist temptation and blinds us to our own insecurity, but it numbs one from execution. Remember in years past, you give somebody uh, uh, some alcohol to kind of numb their fear of what is about to happen. And so Babylon's intoxication, what does it do? It removes a desire for us to resist her influence. Secondly, it blinds us to our own insecurity when we're not trusting in the Lord. Blinds us to the world's apparent security. And blinds us, thirdly, numbs us from fearing a coming judgment. Unbelievers don't fear a coming judgment. 
And when we get too comfortable with the world, we don't either. Notice how Revelation 18 explains the sin of trusting in the world's security that brings judgment. I want you to notice this. Look at chapter 18. <clears throat> the end of verse 7, Babylon says, I sit as a queen. I'm not a widow. I'll never see mourning. She's numbed to her imminent coming judgment. And then verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality <clears throat> and lived sensuously with her, actually lived luxuriously with her is a better Greek, live luxuriously with her, will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. So now, why are they mourning? Well, it's clear that they're mourning over the loss of Babylon <clears throat> and that probably they're going to be judged too. But notice they're also mourning because they had lived luxuriously with her. They're losing their security. They're losing that luxuriousness. Notice also verse 15. Same thing. First we had the kings, now we have merchants who became rich from her and stood at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning. So again, they're mourning over the fact she's been destroyed and imminently they will too, but also they've lost their riches. And finally, verse 19, they threw dust on their heads, they were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one city she'd been laid waste. Again, they're mourning because their Babylonian security has been destroyed, and they're about to be too, but they're mourning over their loss of security. What's Babylon done to them? Intoxicated them. Notice that verse 23, the end of it, notice what the end of verse 23 of chapter 18 says. All the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Your sorcery. The word in Greek is pharmakia. I was just in Greece for a couple of weeks where I lost my voice lecturing too much. And on every corner it says pharmakia. That's the drug store. Okay? This is drugs. Babylon the Great is shooting drugs in the veins of the nations and in our veins to cause us to be more open to temptation, to uh, really blind us to our own insecurity, and to numb us from a coming judgment. That's what the world does. These people that we've looked at, the kings, the merchants, the mariners, they're all people who have lived in careless ease. Remember, that's what Sodom and Gomorrah lived in. Careless ease because of their comfortable relationship and security in the world. Such careless ease is nothing more than the effect of being intoxicated so that this intoxicating effect of careless ease again leads to our temptations, falling into temptations to go along with the world, being numbed to our own insecurity and numbed to a coming judgment. So why will these three classes of people, the kings, the merchants, and the mariners, weep? Well, it's not only because of judgment, and they're about to be judged. They've lost their security, and they still want it. They're still holding on to it. Even though judgment is coming, they're sorry they've left, they've lost their security. As in Babylon, Revelation sees the sin of worldly unbelievers to be that of self-sufficiency, self-confidence, careless ease in themselves and in the world's security instead of confidence in God. People think their own ability to achieve security determines their destiny instead of God. This was Laodicea's problem earlier in the book of Revelation. Listen to chapter 3 about Laodicea in verse 17. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. See, they don't know it. They're, they're so secure in their riches, in their wealth. They don't think they have need of anything. He says, you don't know you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich, white garments that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. I salve, anoint your eyes that you may see. What's Christ doing here? What's he advising them to do? Not advising them to go to a store 
and Laodicea and buy these things. In chapter 1, Christ has been presented as having gold clothing and white garments and piercing eyesight. He's telling them to buy into himself and not into the world. That's what he's telling them there. Again, Ezekiel 16 says that Sodom uh, had a lot of arrogance, a lot of food, and lived in careless ease and did not help the poor and the needy. It wasn't just their immorality for which they were judged. And Lot didn't go along with the immorality, but he was locked in to that careless ease. That's why he did not want to move. He had to have these double commands, and finally, even that didn't help. He had to be dragged out by God's grace. Point is, the chief purpose of humanity in the book of Revelation is to glorify God, enjoy Him, and not glorify one itself and enjoy one's own achievements and security. Chapter 4 and verse 11 says, in fact, listen to it. 4.11 of Revelation, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. In chapter 5 and verse 11, the same thing. Worthy is the Lamb, verse 12, that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and honor and glory and blessing. In verse 13, to him who sits on the throne to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever. But in the book of Revelation, 11 times, Babylon is not just called Babylon. Babylon is called Babylon the Great. Muhammad Ali is famous for saying, I am the greatest. The book of Revelation, according to many versions in verse uh, 17 of chapter 19, says, it's the great God. Only God can be called great. Titus 2.13 says, the, our great God and Savior, we are not great to focus on humanity as the center of everything, to forget God is the greatest sin. Laodicea had begun to do this. Luther said, whatever our heart clings to and confides in, that is really our God. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. So the point is, separate from the world self-confidence and security, lest we be judged like God the world. We should not be like the world, but remain in it to witness and even suffer for that witness. A witness to confidence in God and His security and not in the world. Young people, <clears throat> I don't know how many uh, uh, elementary kids are here today, probably not many, but uh, if there happens to be a remnant somewhere that I'm not seeing, when your friends are doing something you know is not right, do you go ahead and join them or not? Despite the fact they may, may make fun of you. Maybe to be a part of their crowd, you need to use foul language or maybe steal things around the neighborhood. Is your identity more in Christ or with your friends? Are you afraid to be ostracized by them? in your identification with Christ. For those who may be uh, high school, college students, <clears throat> young single people, what's our criteria for dating? Is it the world's? Is it the physical appearance, a, a good personality? All of that is fine. But if it's not also someone's commitment to the Lord that you're attracted to, you're becoming secure in the world and not in the Lord. David Wells in his book, No Place for Truth, defines worldliness in this way. Worldliness, worldliness is what any particular culture does to make sin seem normal and righteousness seem strange. If we are uncomfortable and feel strange with reading our Bibles, with praying, with witnessing out in the world, going to church, then we've been injected with the pharmakia, with the drugs of Babylon. The point of Revelation 18.4 is separate from the world self-confidence and security lest we be judged like the world. Judgment is coming. We've seen that the uh, kings, the uh, merchants, and the mariners 
uh, mourn because they were not only were about to be judged, that Babylon was being judged, but they were losing their security. So we're going to separate from the world self-confidence and security lest we become judged like the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says this, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away. You see, people are grasping onto the world. In reality, the world is passing away, and there's going to be a new world. Will we mourn like the world mourns at the time of judgment? Have we separated ourselves sufficiently spiritually so that we're prepared for eternity? Or will we mourn like the kings and the merchants and the mariners. In fact, chapter 17 of Revelation says this about those who were injected with the intoxicating drugs. Uh, it calls them a certain name in chapter 17, and it's worth looking at. In verse uh, 2, it says this, Babylon, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, now listen to this phrase, and those who dwell on the earth were made to drink with the wine of her immorality. That phrase, those who dwell upon the earth, is used about eight times elsewhere in the book of Revelation. It never refers to Christians. Why? Well, we live on the earth. Why can't we be called earth dwellers? Well, it's because earth dwellers is reserved for idol worshipers in the book of Revelation because this is is their home. This is their ultimate security. They cannot look beyond this physical world for their security. It is their security blanket. Whereas Hebrews 11 says we're pilgrims. We're passing through. I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times that has helped me. When I've started getting too locked in to maybe becoming a little depressed about uh, what's going on in my country. Um, so we're not earth dwellers. This is not our home. But we are attracted to it. It is a place of ease. It, it can be very secure. A telltale sign of true belief is our attitude to separating from the world's security. That's a sign of fruit of perseverance. Do we trust more in Christ or more in the world's security? Where are, where are our loyalties? Only we and the Lord really know. I remember I went to uh, a dental hygienist, um, and this is an illustration about how we need to be shocked out of our uh, attachment to the world's security. Uh, I went to an oral hygienist, and while I was there, she left for a few moments, and I saw on the wall uh, some pictures uh, of gum disease. When she came back, I said, where am I on the chart? She said, oh, yeah, you're, you're getting really toward the part where your, your gums are rotting. I said, but I, I don't feel anything. And she said, that's the genius of gum disease. When it really starts hurting, then you're really in bad shape. And so Babylon injects our veins so that we, we, we're numbed often to our spiritual decline as believers. We need to be shocked out of it by coming to God's Word. It says, come out, come out. The book of Revelation comforts the afflicted, faithful, but afflicts those who are too comfortable with the world. Judgment, sure, it's coming. Would Laodicea be prepared for it? Will you and I be prepared for it? Will we be mourning at the time of judgment? Are rejoicing. In Latin America, they've devised a creative way to catch monkeys in the jungle. They make a hole in a tree. I'm going to read this because it's very detailed. They make a hole in a tree and they cut a coconut in half and put a bright coin in it. And they put the coconut in the hole of the tree. The coin is anchored to a little wire which is attached by a nail to the other side of the inside of the tree. A monkey comes along, sees the open coconut, thinks he has an easy meal. But when he gets closer, he sees the bright coin in the coconut and tries to get it out of the coconut. So he slips his hand in this way, gets the coin, but it won't come out because the hole is not big enough for his closed fist. But he keeps trying. He'll not let go until the keeper of the tra trap comes to check it. Even then, the monkey will not pull his hand out. That's amazing. He leaves, and then he gets caught. 
He, he's holding on to things he shouldn't be holding on to. The kings, the merchants, and the mariners were like that. They, they, they weren't rejoicing in God's judgment. They were sorry that Babylon had been judged, they were going to be, and that they were losing their security. Separate from the world self-confidence and security, lest we be judged like the world. Our only security is in Jesus Christ, who died for us. He came to life again as the Lord God of heaven and earth. Matthew chapter 7 says this, everyone uh, who says to me, Lord, Lord, wow, that's a double Lord, Lord, like come, come out, come out, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But, he's, he, but he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven will enter the kingdom. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and your name perform many miracles? I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. May we not be among those. May we trust in Christ, identify with him and his security and not the world's security. May God give us grace to separate from the world's self-confidence and security lest we be judged like the world. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and so that you will not receive of her plagues. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is inerrant. We thank you that you are a sovereign God and that you command us things. We ask, Lord, for your grace to give us the ability to obey you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.